In today's episode, I'm going to show you how to set up a simple L-band monitoring station for decoding satellite ACARS. Both civilian and military flights now make extensive use of satellite communications, both for unencrypted voice and data traffic, and you can receive these interesting signals for less than $80. If you're new to ACARS decoding and have not yet watched episode 5 on monitoring VHF ACARS, you'll find a bit more information there on the message types you can expect to receive. You can click the link above to watch it now. Let's look at a sample of some of the messages you can receive. Here, a Japanese 777 is over the North Pacific en route to LAX. Once clear of conflicting traffic, Oakland Oceanic cleared the aircraft to flight level 370, or 37,000 feet, for the remainder of the Oceanic crossing. This Air New Zealand Dreamliner was having difficulty when attempting to check in with Oakland on an HF frequency for its backup. So the flight was sent a message via satellite ACARS and given the frequency of 5574 kHz to try. Just like regular ACARS, there are lots of digital ATIS requests. Here, information uniform for Sao Paulo in Brazil was sent to an aircraft. Sometimes, even if a flight is in an area of VHF ACARS coverage, the message will be transmitted via satellite. You will also sometimes receive landing data that is sent to aircraft. In this message, a Hawaiian Airlines A330 was sent data regarding the suggested landing configuration for its arrival in Honolulu. A brief weather report shows the wind speed and direction, along with the outside air temperature and the barometric pressure, or Q&H. Runway 8 left has 12,312 feet available for landing. With full flaps at the calculated landing weight of 380 tonnes, the lowest auto brake setting will stop the aircraft in 9,234 feet. A couple of other weights and brake settings are also listed for the pilots. In order to receive satellite ACARS messages, you need to be within the footprint of a satellite. Looking at the map here, you'll observe that with the exception of the high Arctic and Antarctic regions, the whole globe is covered. That means, with some simple equipment and free software, you can start decoding these messages. From my location in Western Canada, I can receive the 98 degree west satellite and the 54 degree west satellite. When I lived in Europe, I could receive the 54 degree west satellite and the 25 degree east satellites. By studying the map, you can work out which satellites you will be able to receive. The L-band signals around 1.5 GHz carry the data going from the various ground stations to aircraft. These signals can be received across the world with small antennas you can easily hold. These are the signals we will be focusing on during this episode. C-band signals are transmitted in a 3.6 GHz range and carry the traffic going from the aircraft to ground stations. Receiving these generally requires a large dish and more advanced hardware, so we are not looking at this side of things today. To begin receiving and decoding satellite ACARS, you need a few inexpensive items and some free software. Firstly, you need a software-defined radio. For best compatibility, you want an STR that has a bias T output, this sends a small voltage to power the external devices, such as low noise amps, or LNAs for short, and active antennas. The STRs shown here from STR Play and AirSpy all have this feature and cover the correct frequency ranges. However, the $28 RTL SDR version 3 software defined radio has a software switchable by ST and actually provides excellent reception in the L band range. The common Nualex Smart version 4 does not have a bias T, so I do not recommend it for L-band satellite work. However, the Nualex Smart T has a permanently enabled bias T and works very well for the type of setup I will be showing today. I frequently use both these STRs for L-band satellite reception. Next, you need a suitable antenna. There are a number of off-the-shelf products available for L-band satellite monitoring. The three I am mentioning today are antennas I have previously reviewed right here on this channel. Links to those reviews are in the description below. The SDR Kits Modified GPS Patch Antenna sells for just $15 or around 15 UK pounds. This was actually my first Inmarsat antenna. It is small, weatherproof and has a built-in low noise amp but has no filtering and because of its size it has lower gain. 
This means the signals received with it are weaker than with the other antennas mentioned here. However, if you want to begin experimenting with L-band decoding at the lowest possible price point, this little patch antenna will get you receiving if you have a good clear view of the sky. The $50 second generation RTL SDR patch is my current favourite antenna for decoding satellite ACARS. It is the largest of the three antennas I'm talking about today, which translates to the highest gain and best ability to decode. It comes with a low noise amp and filter built right into the rugged waterproof plastic housing and is shipped with two mounts, a mini flexible legged tripod and a suction cup for mounting the antenna to glass. An RG174 coax patch cable with SMA connectors is included. This is by far the most comprehensive setup and absolute best bang for your buck patch antenna in terms of price and performance. It receives the satellite signals with a much higher signal to noise ratio than the other antennas listed here. I recommend watching my review video on this antenna which you can see by clicking above or in the description below. The biggest downside of this antenna is its current availability. At the time this episode is being produced, the unit is out of stock from Amazon US and the RTLSDR.com store on account of the global supply chain shortages particularly affecting electronics. Within a few months the antenna will likely be available again, so keep an eye out for stock becoming available. The third option will cost you $80. It is the Nualec Inmarsat Reception Bundle, which includes a patch antenna, Sawbird LNA and filter, SMA connectors and a short patch cable. This gets you most of what you need to receive, however you will have to supply your own mounting solution such as a mini tripod. This unit is also not weatherproof, so if you plan on using it outdoors regularly, you would need to fabricate a case for it. Reception wise, it works fairly well. I've been able to perform regular and stable decoding with the one I use. The gain is higher than the SDR kits antenna but lower than the RTL SDR patch. If you already own a suitable low noise amp and filter, you can buy the PCB patch part on its own for less than $30, which is a good deal. With Nualec handling worldwide distribution through Amazon stores, getting hold of the bundle is quick and easy. It probably goes without saying that you'll need a PC of some kind. I typically use an old Windows laptop for SATCOM decoding. The software listed here is all Windows based and is all available at no cost. So you need some SDR software. I use SDR Sharp available from airspy.com. Just go to the airspy site, click download at the top and then download and install the latest version. If you've already got SDR Sharp or an other SDR software installed, you can skip this step. Next, a virtual cable is required. I'm using Vincent Burrell's excellent and free VB cable. Make sure you go to the virtual audio tab, then download and install the software on your system. This adds a virtual device to your computer, which can be used to send audio from SDR Sharp to the decoding software. Jero takes the incoming audio stream and extracts the data from it, presenting it in various windows that we will explore shortly. There's a link to the Jero site where you can download the latest version of the software below. When I was making this video, the main Jero site was down, but you can still access the download from the releases section of the GitHub site. When SDR Sharp is launched, it's important to perform a few tasks. The first is to set up the audio. When viewing the audio tab, make sure that the filter audio option is not checked. Then change the audio output to your virtual cable by using the drop down box selector. I also like to drag the audio panel over to the other side of the display and position it below the radio panel. But this is just a matter of personal preference. Next we launch Jero and enter the settings menu. In the sound card section, we want to ensure our virtual cable is selected, or Jero will not be able to hear the signals coming from SDR Sharp. While in the settings menu, we can make note of the logs directory. You can change where Jero saves logs, and you can also enable or disable logging. I like to log a text file so that I can go back and read the communications at a later stage. Note, there is a database download section, but this no longer works. Lastly, we prep Jero for receiving a 600 BPS channel 
by making sure the speed parameter is set correctly. We want to begin looking for the 600 BPS channels as these are the easiest to receive and decode. I like to extend my windows so I get lots of screen real estate. When SDR Sharp is started it is tuned to the commercial FM broadcast band. We want to retune it up to the 1.545 GHz part of the spectrum. This is known as the L band. We also want to set the modulation to USB. This is an important step as without doing it we won't be able to receive anything. Next we need to ensure the RF gain is turned up to maximum. Click the cog icon and adjust the gain slider all the way to the right. Nothing else needs to be changed. You can see that some signals are already starting to become visible. Each of these is a transponder that transmits 24-7 which makes it easy to find the signals. Here is my setup outside. You can see my old laptop and the RTL SDR 2nd gen L-band patch antenna which is pointing directly upwards. This doesn't provide optimum signal strength for Inmarsat but does yield some signals as we already saw. I am using the Nualex Smarty Dongle, the $34 bias T enabled one which is powering the LNA and filter inside the patch antenna. To increase the signal strength we want to point the patch antenna in the direction of the satellite. I do this by rotating it and adjusting the elevation while closely watching the display on SDR Sharp. If I move away from the correct position the signals fade away. When I'm aiming at the satellite the transponders become visible again and the spikes on the display increase in length. This indicates a higher signal to noise ratio. It is always best to try and find the position that provides the highest signal to noise ratio. I find SDR Sharp easier on the eye when I adjust the contrast and range settings. Another thing to note is that the three Inmarsat birds I have viewed have two distinct groups of aviation transponders as you can see on the screen. The lower groups carry the lower speed 600 and 1200 BPS transponders and the upper groups have the high speed data and voice transponders. Although my antenna is pointing towards the 98 degree west satellite some of the lower speed 54 degree west satellite transponders are also visible. With the view zoomed in a little more it's easier to make sure that the correct frequency gets tuned. However Gero doesn't pick up on it right away so we have to look for the hump on the Gero display and click on it to center the frequency. As soon as we do a number of things happen. First the signal and data lights turn green. The signal light lets us know that Gero has identified a signal. The data light tells us that data is being extracted and decoded from the signal. We can also observe some text appearing in the Gero SU window. As it syncs up we see a few error messages and bad CRC messages then it stabilizes and begins to fill the screen with data. This is a PSMC channel which broadcasts a continual stream of information about the transponders in each of the four active Inmarsats. The avionics on board the aircraft utilize this data when establishing connections with the satellites. The other thing we can see is a constellation display which is divided into four quadrants. The tighter the yellow dots group together the better the signal we have. Here they are nice and tight. A quick look at STR Sharp shows us that we are maintaining a good signal to noise ratio over 20 dB. Gero seems to be able to decode reliably down to a signal to noise ratio of around 9 dB. Since this transponder is sending a continual stream of data to aircraft we won't receive any ACARS specific traffic on it. For that we will have to look at some of the other active transponders. When I retune SDR Sharp to the next strong transponder Gero automatically adjusts itself in preparation for decode. It doesn't take long to get the three green lights at the bottom indicating that all is well with the signal and data streams. The usual bad CRC messages appear and I click on the ACARS tab so I can watch for any messages being transmitted to aircraft. There doesn't seem to be much activity so I quickly move on to the next transponder. When I look back at the SU tab I can see an acknowledgement and user message listed in the display. This indicates that data has been sent to an aircraft. When I check back on the ACARS tab a message has indeed been received. This looks like part of a load sheet providing the flight crew with a fuel upload figure. The next transponder I tune to carries data at 1200 BPS, twice as fast as the previous transponders. You can see it has a wider bandwidth than SDR Sharp. 
Jero is unable to automatically select the correct speed, so 1200 BPS needs to be selected from the drop down box. Jero quickly retunes, and I can see a great signal in the constellation. Looking back at SDR Sharp, shows around 26 dB. I didn't receive any messages on the 1200 BPS channel, so moved along to another 600 BPS transponder. Next, I opened the Jero plane log, which lists the aircraft that have been received and displays their ICAO hex code, listed as AES, the registration number, the first and last times they've been received, and message counts. So far, I can see three aircraft are listed. Not long after viewing that data, a new ACARS message appears. A ground station has requested an updated position report from the avionics on an FedEx MD-11 freighter. I see this data displayed with a Jero. However, if you're starting out with Jero, you will not get some of the extra information on my screen. You will see the hex code and registration, but not the aircraft type and owner data. That information is being pulled from a database I was given about a year ago. Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be a good source of obtaining this database for updates. If you are aware of such a database that can be freely downloaded and applied to Jero, please do provide details in the comment section below. As I prepare to move on to another transponder, another message appears, and so I open the plane log again and notice that I now have more aircraft listed in the log. There are multiple transponders that can be explored, but not all are part of the classic aero service we are trying to decode. For example, there are a few transponders that are 3.5 to 5 kHz wide. I do not know what information is on these transponders, but I can tell you that Jero is unable to decode them. What we want to find are the high speed transponders, which are much more active than the 600 and 1200 BPS ones we have looked at so far. Here I zoom in for a closer look. I have to modify the receive bandwidth in SDR Sharp to make sure that all the data can be fed to Jero. Then in Jero, the speed needs to be set for 10,500 BPS. After the usual error messages, you can see that lots of aviation data starts streaming through the SU window. It is showing acknowledgments of messages being received by aircraft, data being transmitted to aircraft, and channel assignments. Flicking over to the ICARS tab, you can see the messages streaming in. As you can see, the higher speed transponders are significantly busier than the lower speed ones. Opening the plane log reveals that more aircraft have been listed in the last few seconds than the previous 20 minutes of monitoring the 600 and 1200 BPS channels. ATIS reports, CPDLC, air traffic control instructions, ADSC contracts, ops messages and load sheets start appearing in the ACARS window. They often come in so quickly it's hard to keep up, which is why we enabled logging in the settings earlier. The higher speed transponders are received at lower signal strengths. You can see the SNR hovering around 15 dB in SDR Sharp. Small repositioning adjustments can be made on the antenna with the goal of finding the highest signal to noise ratio. You can also see the constellation display in Jero still shows four groups of yellow dots, but they are spread apart much more than before. I move on to the next high speed transponder and clicking the SU tab again shows me that lots of data is being transmitted to aircraft on this channel. Clicking back on the ACARS tab, we can see that a flight crew is being informed of the current score in a European soccer match. ACARS messages continue to be received from various air traffic control centers. Since the satellites cover a massive geographical area, in the last few minutes we have seen messages from French Guiana in Brazil in South America, Trinidad in the Caribbean, New York and Oakland in the United States, Edmonton and Gander in Canada, and more. I'm sure you'll have noticed lots of ATSU and AFN codes in the ACARS messages. Thankfully we can look those up in a table and identify the station transmitting the messages. I found this PDF on one of the ACARS mailing lists at groups.io. Many of the folk there are experienced ACARS decoders and are happy to share lots of information with other enthusiasts. I've left a link to this group in the description below. When I select either of the two weakest high speed transponders, I get a signal and data lock in Jero and can see occasional messages in the SU window. 
However, these transponders appear to be much quieter than the other two, so I return to those and continue to receive lots of data. After about 20 minutes of checking out the low and high speed transponders for ACARS messages, I open the plane log and see that I have received messages going to over 100 different aircraft. And this is during a time of lower flight numbers on account of the global pandemic. One way I particularly enjoy satellite ACARS monitoring is by using sites like Flight Radar 24. I'll copy a registration number from the Gero ACARS window and paste it into the search box. This will then locate the aircraft and show me its details and current position if known. Oftentimes I'll have to zoom out in order to see exactly where the plane is. In this example I can see Air Canada 7284. Flight Radar 24 informs me it is flying from Tokyo, Japan to Toronto, Canada. When I zoom out I can see it is presently located over northern Manitoba. The next aircraft I view is routing from Paris, France to Cayenne in French Guiana. It is over the Atlantic. Aircraft can also be looked up via their ICAO hex code or AAS code in Gero parlance. Lastly, I'll mention that if you choose to compile the AMBI codec for Gero, you will be able to monitor some of the 8400 BPS voice channels that regularly appear. I'm just relaying some information about the weather back here. So there's isolated thunderstorms around the area, but, but definitely landable. Uh, not a real huge impact right now. Uh, between 1830Z and 20Z, weather is estimating that we will be, you know, there will be no operations here. There's a fairly significant line coming through. How copy that? As we end the video today, I want to say thanks to all my subscribers for faithfully following along with the channel. A special thanks goes out to those who have made donations over on the frugalradio.com site. It's always exciting to receive gifts from viewers who appreciate the channel. Hopefully you've enjoyed learning about satellite ACARS in this episode. Although it appears complicated, it's actually one of the easiest forms of ACARS to receive, so I hope you feel inspired to try it out. If the video has been helpful to you, let me know in the comments below. If you love radio communications and software defined radio, why not join the channel? You just have to subscribe and hit the notification bell to receive alerts when new content comes out. It's been great having you back on the channel, but for now, this is Frugal Radio, out. <laughs>